Okay. Hello and welcome back, everyone. Hi. Hope you had a good break. Uh, we are now, we have now arrived at the final lesson of this code refinery workshop, where we will be talking about modular code development. We will have one break at around 1140 or when we find a good break point. And this lesson is a demo for you, but we would like to ask you to participate via the Hedgedog document and we will tell more about that later. So there will be no exercise sessions in the groups anymore. So we have already put uh, some questions in the Hedgedog all the way to the bottom. Another one is showing them here. So if you please go there and fill out what does modular code development mean for you? What best practices can you recommend to arrive at the well-structured modular code in your favorite programming language? And then also, what do you know about programming that you wish somebody has told you earlier? And while you're filling that out, we can maybe do a small introduction round, Radovan. Yes, so I'm really so much looking forward to this session. Um, Radovan Bast, University of Tromsø doing code refinery and research software engineering, high performance computing support. Really, I enjoy working on the interface between computing and research and helping students, researchers write better code and learning from them. Oh yeah, very important, yeah. Yeah, and hi, my name is Samantha. I work at CSC in Finland as a geoinformatics specialist. And I also really enjoy working between the computer and the researchers here at CSC a little bit and help research to, to make use of our computing resources. And I've been part of Code Refinery now for a few years and I actually started by visiting the first Code Refinery, or not the first Code Refinery workshop, but a Code Refinery workshop. And I got really interested in it and then became a helper and now also a bit instructing. And that's awesome, and hopefully we get more people really excited about this who can then join in future. Yes, it's totally possible. Yep. And through this co-teaching way that we do things here, it's really low barrier to start teaching also this stuff. Um, yeah, we see already people are answering the questions, uh, but should we talk about the learning outcomes of this lesson a little bit also? Yes, and before moving away from these, I, can, I just want to say that I really love these answers and we will come back to those and reconnect to these. And we will also tell you what we think is, what does it mean for us? And what, did, what do we know now that we wish we knew earlier? And so now I go to this um, lesson material. It says modular type along, but I think it's not a good name. I think really the, as Samantha said, the best way to participate I think it's not to type along. You can try that later. There is a walkthrough. But the best way to participate right now is to watch us uh, demonstrate, but you can influence it. So please influence through through the collaborative document that we are watching on next to the next to my browser. So I will now go in there. Yes, here we are. Well, learning outcomes. That's so yeah, wanted, that, right? Yes, perfect. So as the le lesson title suggests, we're going to be talking about modular code development, but we're not only going to talk about it, we're actually going to do it um, while live coding here on stream and hopefully get a lot of input from you via the collaborative document. Um, but the goal of the lesson is that we get to know uh, about pure functions, what they are, um, how to how to use them, um, how we can uh, limit side effects of function, and we're also going to talk about what what that is, what that means. Um, also the side effects of data, and then um, discussing a bit the functions that have a single purpose only, and why they're often preferred over functions that have multiple purposes. Mm -hmm. And um, then also uh, like why it helps to do this 
um, modular code development over writing like one script with everything, everything one after another. And then yeah. also the global versus local structures. And some of these may sound a bit abstract or even not even clear what they mean. Um, and we will try to really demonstrate these and clarify these, but in a very practical way, we will build up together a script program in one hour. It will be a little bit stressful for us, but now all the exercise leads can relax because there won't be any group sessions anymore, but we want everybody here now in via stream, via the document to, to participate. And we will then try to keep it re real and we will try to experience these, um, these concepts. And also this lesson is also meant to bring together everything that we have learned in this code refinery workshop. So we will see also a little bit, hopefully a we have time to also connect it to all the lessons of version control, testing, documentation, reusability. So really all the topics that we have been talking about. And we will do this in a Jupyter notebook. So also this lesson is covered and how to then move out of the Jupyter notebook. So hopefully that also gives you a bit of the, the big picture of where this whole code refining workshop can, can be also part of your work. Mm -hmm. Okay, should we go back to the hedge dog? There is yeah, quite a lot of. I also type in my ones myself, which down there. So, what does it mean to you, Radovan? So, I'm the person typing there below A, so that I can copy paste a function from a, one project or a notebook into another, and it still works. And it can be a function, it can be a module package portion of the code. So if I set up my code in a, in a modular way, I can then reuse things in different notebooks and I can copy paste them out. Um, by doing so, I also make it, so code build up from little components. Because then if I want to, it, it's easier to understand the component than the whole thing. So that's what it means to, for me. What does it mean for you? Yeah, the same. <laughs> um, yeah, and I've been reading here in the answers also. I think all of these answers um, also relate to what you just said. Many functions working separately, yeah. a function that performs one task. And that's also really, um what it what it also means to me so when i started i had often the problem that i noticed myself oh i've written this function before and i have it in some other place in some other project but it was not really reusable so i had to kind of write this function again because it was a bit too complicated to go back and change that function that i had written already to make it more general mm -hmm. so like noticing this made me made me think okay that, that, like rather from the beginning, start to do it modular and reusable later. Yeah, but what we will also maybe see is that it's impossible and unreasonable to make things beautiful, perfect from the start, because we don't know where we are going to. We, we cannot know. This is research, things are evolving. So this is an iterative process. We start somewhere and then we improve, and then we modularize more, we modularize more if needed. And maybe we will see this progression in this process. Yes, Should once you learn what, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's continue with the, what best practice, practices can you recommend? Yeah, so some of these we will hopefully see and we will then also maybe get practical suggestions. So these things that are listed here, we will see them. Also, what do we know now that we wish we knew earlier? We will see some of these things later. Yeah, my answer to that would be everything I learned in the code refinery workshops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would have saved me so much time in the very beginning of my computational research career. I think I'm writing one more thing here, team up with somebody and mentor each other. That I wish I'd, I had done more. 
Super good. So we have these questions. We will also then, hopefully, we will get many questions from participants as we code along. So what is the what is the what is our task that we need to do that we want to work on? Yeah, let's go back to the lesson material and into the next our task section. Right. So we have now here prepared already a small script that. Uh, will make use of a data file, which is called here in the top temperatures.csv, so a comma separated value file, maybe we can show it. So it's in a GitHub repository. It includes years, month, date, time, and then the air temperature. Is it at Helsinki airport? I think it's I think. Helsinki airport and you mentioned comma separated. Here we see a table because GitHub renders it, but if I click on raw, then I see the actual file and it's a comma separated, so lots of values. Yes. So some temperature measurements in Helsinki a few years ago. And then what is our goal to, with this, what do we want to do with the data? So we you want can... to oh, yeah. mm, continue. Right. No, we, uh, we... okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we, what we, let's imagine we get the task that we want to plot the 25 first measurements. That's one thing. So we want to plot some data. It's these temperatures. We also want to do some statistics, but we want to keep it simple. We want to compute the arithmetic mean and plot it. And now we can imagine that we get this task. So now I go to the internet and I ask Stack Overflow. And from some Stack Overflow research, I have pieced together this Python script and it works and it will be our starting point and we will test it out now. But I also want to say something about Python is that we will now demonstrate it with Python, but I know that many of you don't write Python in your work. And this session is not about Python. We we take Python because we need something, something real, but we will try to not focus on the Python specifics. We will, it, we will also not write the most beautiful Python code we will try to keep it really simple and hopefully we can see through the language and we can sort of in our heads translate it to our own language. So we'll and try please that. ask also in the collaborative document if there's anything unclear that is maybe Python specific here. Maybe what we can do is we can test it out and we can also comment a bit on what's happening here. Um, and it will make all sense and then we can then we will get a new task. Once we get it to work, we will get a new task. Uh, but let's first get it to work. Should I start with? Uh, how should? Where should I start with this thing? Where would you start? Mm, I would probably put it in a Jupyter notebook to have because we see here there's some. We want to plot something, yeah. and I, I feel like it's always nice to then see it in the very same window where where we have the code to play around with it and. Um, adjust everything. Yeah, this will be a nice start. And yesterday we learned about notebooks. Let me start one. Just need to adjust a little bit my different windows. I will start the notebook. The way I like to start it is, I like to start it with this no browser because then I can decide in which browser I want to open it up. And it gives me this, Let's open this up. And I will keep it running here. We don't need the terminal quite yet because we are in the, in the notebook. Well, maybe we need it soon, but um, I will start a new Python notebook. And again, this lesson says start along, but the best way to participate is to watch and type on the collaborative document suggestions okay. and questions yes we will need your help in a moment yeah this is really meant to be an improv we don't know what will happen it's really fun and really stressful the first thing i will maybe do before doing anything is to change it from untitled to something else temperatures did i start it in the right folder hopefully and let's copy 
let's copy paste this code into it and let's see whether it's working. Suspense. Yeah, so from the lesson material, you can find this, what Radovan just clicked this little copy button when you hover over the gray box, yep. then it will appear in the upper right corner that copies the whole box for you. So you don't yep. need to mark yep. it all. But better watch, there is also a, like a one possible walkthrough. So you can go to all the steps that we might or might not do later. We have this thing, I want to test it out. How was that again? Shift enter to run a cell. I suspect I will get an error message, but it will be really useful to see. Boom. Because that's really useful because we can learn how do we look at error messages. I like to, when I see anything like this, I scroll on down to the very end of it. Because very often, at least in Python, the interesting thing, so I read these error messages always from the bottom up. So there is a lot of stuff that I don't recognize, but the, the thing that makes sense to me is that I try to open this file and I don't have it. I don't have it on my folder. So now let's just verify where, where am I here with the notebook. So I need to download the file and one really convenient way to download this is to click on raw. I copy this address. And then in my terminal, you can use commands like wget. Oops, that didn't work. No, oh, that didn't work either. Let's see. You can use commands like wget or curl to fetch data sets. Oops, trying again. Hmm. Copy pasting. Here we go. And now it's, it downloaded um, this temperatures to CSV file onto my hard drive. Let's go back to the, to the notebook and let's try that thing again. I mm know -hmm. I have a suspicion that I started the notebook in the wrong place. So how can you find out where you started it? Yep, how, how, how can I do that? Yeah, all right. So I wanted to start it in inside the subfolder, but I didn't. So now I will just move my data file along level. And now we don't need to see these things for a little bit. I will close that and now it will work. Now I'm in the same. The notebook is in the same place as the data file. We have we have a plot. And now um, there are, of course, it's not a fantastic plot. There is no, there are no axis annotations, so we don't really know what is being plotted. But the so the red line is our temperatures in centigrade. The blue dashed line is, I believe, the arithmetic mean. Yes. yes, that's the one. And let, now let me also walk you through the script, what is going on here. We are importing a couple of modules, libraries. This one is for manipulating data. This one is in Python for plotting data. And then we were asked to do 25 measurements. We, we read the data from this file, temperatures.csv. I could have also put in the, the web address directly. Um, 25 of these, we extract, we are interested in the air temperature. We, don't, we are not interested in any of the other columns. Then we do some statistics, very simple. We comp compute the arithmetic mean, which is the sum of temperatures divided by how many we measure. And then we do some plotting. And here, we don't need to know this. We don't need to remember this. I, I don't remember this every time I search for an example. And this is the example that we found on the internet. We, this will plot what, what I want to plot here. It will also save it in, it will save the figure into a file. All right, so that's not too bad, but now the task has changed a little bit. Now our supervisor is happy we got this working, but now 
our task change, we also need want to plot the first hundred and the first five hundred measurements. Yeah, and that is now the task for uh, that we're going to start with here. So we can ask that in the collaborative document. How how would you tackle this? Give us hints. Give us suggestions and, about how to start, how to go on. Yeah. And while you do that, what I will do because it's just really not not nice. I want to add some some axis annotations. So let me do that. And I will do it in a way that is, again, not really amazing, but it will work. So now I, again, web searched that this will, X label, Y label will label these axes with less very five. So at least now I have, now I have something on my X and Y axes. Later we no. will maybe see that this is not super, but it works. Then we could also add a title so that everyone knows what is actually shown in the plot when they just see the plot. plt.title. Yeah, works. So yeah. So we have already many votes for make a function. Mm -hmm. mm with one input, which is the number of the data for X. So basically put the num measurements as an argument. Mm -hmm. There's a suggestion. Good, good, good. Um, make a function, we will do that. I think I admit that I would probably not start right away with the function. I think I would be a little bit lazier and I would, try to do this thing three times. Once for 25, once for 100, once for 500. Maybe yeah, I because we like have that. only been asked three times, but it's still. Yeah. And of course, all of this could go into a function. So I could do that. I could put all of this into a function and then call the function with argument 25, 100, 500. Maybe not, not a bad idea. We can do that. Otherwise, what I would have tried is this. Instead of setting it to 25, I would iterate over a couple of values. And in Python, we do it like this, non measurements in 2500, 500. So that's one way to iterate. And then in Python, I need to then indent everything. And then it will do because it's still not right, because right now all I do is I indentation, indentation, indentation. It's still not fully right, why not? Because I shouldn't use here. I shouldn't use 25 here, this is not right. Because otherwise it will create three times the file. 25 num measurements. All right, will this work? Should we test? Let's test it and see what's happening. Oh, very good suggestions there. Very, very good. Um, but let me first start by. Yeah, I got three plots. They look pretty good. One problem is that only the first plot has annotations, the other plots don't have. Interesting. Let's see whether we can fix that later. I also want to, we got this very good suggestion to, A, before we did, try to do any big things here, how about we create a Git repository? Very good. Let me do that. I will do it in my, I will do that in my, um, Terminal, but you could also do that directly out of the notebook. I'm just not sure I have installed all these all these uh, extensions. So how did that work? Git status. Did I already create a Git repository? No, I didn't. 
And that should have been really my first step. And thanks for the suggestion. And how did that work? Get in it. Get in it. I have now an empty Git repository, Git status. And now there are a couple of things. What do I want to track in Git? I want to definitely track the data. I also want to track the notebook. Okay, Git status. And these things, well, maybe I don't want to track them because they, the images are generated, these checkpoint files are generated. Why did we put these into the git.git .git ignore? And now I will use my favorite editor since nobody else is typing, maybe. So we can watch. So VI is then is my, my editor of choice. Git ignore. Things that I don't want to track, they belong into .git ignore. And here they are. And instead of listing all of these, I can even say any PNG, any image that is generated, I don't want to track because I can recreate them. Okay, git status. And I do want to have to get .git ignoring it. And now I could commit all of this stuff. Let's do it, git commit message first kind of working version. Good idea to, whoops. And we have, a, we have one commit. And now, now if I mess up, I can go back. Super nice. Yeah, and then there's also a comment about documenting your code and explain why we're doing this. Yes, and I was asked to share the history of my shell, which I do here, but I need to make it a little bit larger. Document the code and explain why you're doing this, yes. Yeah, we have a little bit of documentation here in inside the code. Um, to document these blocks. But let's see whether we, oh, whenever I do something done, anything tricky, I should also add a um, comment on why we did that to remember next time you're looking at the code. Yeah. And there was Why? the suggestion of, uh, now I, I think I want to go back to functions because many people wanted functions. Let's create some functions. And I could put all of this into a function, but maybe let's do it differently. Let's have maybe one function for plotting, one function for statistics, one function for reading data. How about that? Let me maybe start with the plotting. So I can, do, I can, let's copy paste this into here. I like to define functions on top of. So why do you choose car. to do this separate and not put it all in one function? Mm, because, because um, here I plot temperatures, but in my other projects, I have some other value, but actually everything is the same except the file name, except the data values. And then it, then I want to reuse it. So this plot function, so the way I really like when functions do one thing and not many different things, because then they become more usable. They also become easier to understand because somebody specializing on plotting then doesn't need to understand how is the data read and and how is the data massaged and all the statistics the person can focus on the plotting so easier to understand easier to reuse let's call it plot temperatures or we can, maybe we can be even a little bit more general and call it plot data so it doesn't have to be temperatures it can be data so something goes in data comes in what else will come in maybe the file name And then instead of this, I can use the file name. And instead of, oh yeah, well, instead of temperatures, I will use data. Let's see whether this will work. And then, in, then what I can do down here is instead of doing all this code, I can call it plot data. And here it 
Perichurus. The file name, what was that? It was. And all of this I don't need, hopefully. And observe also that now this comment got a little bit redundant because I don't know, like now actually the function got a little, maybe I don't need this comment anymore because now reading this function call, I think I understand what will happen. It, it puts some data. I send in some data and I send in the, um, the file name. And if I want to make it even a little bit more readable and understandable, I can do this. File name. So maybe it became a little bit easier to read. Should we try whether this is still working? Yes. It is still working. And maybe it's working, maybe maybe I'm even surprised that it's working. Just catching up also with, with the document. Um, the thing that surprises me a little bit is that I'm using the mean inside the function, but I never define it. It's defined much later. And that is a little bit of a Python thing. It's also a little bit of a because now my Jupyter notebook remembers things that I have defined. One thing you could try, and that was a really good, um, good practice with notebooks, is before celebrating that something is working, what I do is I rerun the whole uh, cells from top to bottom. I also may start, I try to restart the kernel and run everything. So like full reset. Let's see what this will like. Restart, rerun the whole thing. And it's still working. Ha. Huh. And I think here it's a Python, Python thing. So we can in Python, I can actually access something that has been defined later, which is which is maybe not so nice. But you will notice this. Well, remember I said that for me it means copy paste ability. Once I copy paste this into my other notebook well, it will not work anymore because the, the variable called mean will not be defined there and it will, it will crash. So to make this even more reusable, I should do this. I should really send it in. Maybe. What else can we do? Yep. So just on 36, would it be better to give it a better name? Yes, because this, so I could give it a more specific name. Um, maybe we can also now move all these other code into separate functions. Yes, that was also one of the suggestions. There's plotting mean and then yeah. reading. Yes, and also what's something I forgot to do, I wanted to put, you wanted to tuck this in, into the function as well. And when we do that, we will actually see that now it will start working for all of the other plots. But that's all. Uh, so if I run this now, shift enter. Now we get axis annotation for all the three plots, nice. And that connects to what is a global setting? What is a local setting? We have now made it more localized by packing it in into the into this little box, and the little box is now called plot data. And we want to have more of these, so we will have one which is called compute mean. What will go in? Some data. And if we want more measurements. And so a function typically receives some, some input and it returns some output. Here we want to return the mean. We can even, this is even a little bit redundant because, because we know the length of 
Date huh? So we can divide by its length. And it shouldn't say temperatures, but it should say data. So the mean is the sum divided by how many? So that we have, so instead of, and again, notice how this will document itself suddenly. Instead of saying this, I can say mean equals, and the data is now temperatures. So we don't need, we don't need this. And then I will do the same thing with reading the data. Yet another, yet another function. Read data from our file name. And we want to know how many measurements. And then some magic should happen. And what should it return? It should return data. And what is the magic? Oh, well, well. Now I'm hesitating because I want to make it already a little bit more generic. Well, let me first do it like this and then let me make some improvements. So we want to have a file name here. I'll name this looks good. And then prayer choose this looks good. And here I can say read data. What was it? The number of measurements. Could this oh, air temperature also be a input to the read data function, like which column we want to. Yeah, exactly, because what if what if I want to read something else than temperatures? I can make it, like in my other project, it's a different thing. Yeah, and maybe the table it. also has, I don't know, humidity or something yeah. in it. So if we wanted to change that, then it's nicer to have the column name also as an input to the function. Right. Rather than having to change it in the. So how will that work? In fact, I can do this data column. I don't need this at all. So now we can ask for air temperature or for something else. And Pretty you can nice. now see how nice and clean suddenly the whole code becomes much more readable. We, also, we still have to edit it in the loop or no, it's already there. So should we test it? Well, it doesn't error and looks pretty all right. Yeah. Suggestion 38, now we already made it a little bit too abstract, but okay, it's read data now. What about formatting your plot? Mm -hmm. There's an answer to it. What else can we do? Um, do I see any problems here? Yeah, we could of course be a little bit more general here. This could be an argument, but it's working for the moment. Okay. All right. So we are now 40 minutes past. I'm wondering when is a good time to take a break. Um, Maybe this is a good time. It's a good time. Um, maybe people can think a little bit about one thing I might want to do after the break is um, add some tests so that we reconnect it to the, to the earlier lesson. Because here these these functions are really simple, but what if they what if the statistics is a bit more complex than computing the mean? What if what if this is not only three lines of code, but what if this is twenty lines of code? How how would we test it? Maybe we can do it after the break. So we will start ten minutes later. Fifty past.
and then try to implement testing. And maybe we will hit a place where notebook is maybe not anymore a good fit, and maybe we'll move out into a script. So think about it, collect more suggestions. I will catch up with the document and we start again at 50 past. And we are back one minute bonus break time. <clears throat> so let's summarize a little bit what happened before the break. We started with a, with a task to plot a data file, which happened to be temperatures in Helsinki. And we chose Python, but doesn't matter. Here we are not focusing on the, on the language, but more on the approach. We read a data file. We did some statistics with it, and we plotted it. We started with in a notebook. We started in one file, everything sort of left aligned. Um, and that's how I often start. And then as things grow, I try to organize the code into functions for several reasons. One reason is reusability. But actually, for me, the main reason is it makes it easier for me to understand it, because then I can focus if I'm focusing on statistics, I focus only on the function. If I focus on the plotting, I only have to focus on this. And then if I want to see how do these things, how do they combine, then I only focus on the main part of my code. And while doing so, it also became a little bit more readable. And we got really nice questions. And I want to clarify some of these now before moving on. There was a question about side effects and pure functions. So I, I really want to demonstrate that. So what is a side effect? Let's go back here to num measurements, which was not ideal, but it's still working. And I may, I may not notice that this is not ideal. It still produces the plots. But you will notice that this is a function with a side effect. I don't really maybe see it here, but I will see it once I try to reuse it in a different notebook. So let me copy this into a different notebook here. OK, I define a function. Fine. But now let's do something with it. Print, compute, mean. And now let's set in some numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, numbers. But what I expected, it will now return a number, but it will give me an error instead. And now it's complaining that, well, I don't know what num measurements is never defined. So this is the side effect. This function has a side effect. It doesn't influence anything outside, but it depends on something outside. So functions with side effects are functions that change data outside of their definition, or they depend on data outside of their definition. Oh, sorry, wrong tab. So this was better because then, and you may not see that if you are not familiar with Python, but uh, what is better here is that the function only depends on input values that, that are explicitly defined. It doesn't have any side effects. If I send in the same, same input, it will always produce the same output. It will always produce the same mean. So this is a pure function without side effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should really switch to the HackMD when talking about questions. So the other question that we can maybe quickly comment on is this one. Oh. So when I develop my project out of many small functions, how to combine them? How should we approach it? And I think it's difficult to give a clear recipe. Um, so we try to build this castle out of these little Lego bricks. 
and these little bricks are our functions. In my experience, it when I build this castle, I, I often have to then build it a second time because only once I see it, I understand how it should have been. So it's, it's difficult to know right from the start how things should be. Um, I like to split. I have a feeling sometimes for when a function is too big, if I have difficulties describing it, if I have difficulties giving it a name, then it's maybe too big, too many things. So then I split it up. I try to use standard data um, structures. And then, um, but the function is never like reusable right from the start. I, it, it's, it's a process. And one can either start from components and build up this castle or sometimes I start from the big picture. I make a drawing on paper from of the big castle and I don't think so much about components, but I think, well, here is this tower and here is this wall, and but it's still too complicated. How can I break it up further? And how can I break it up further? And now I arrive at small digestible functions. Not sure whether this was really a helpful answer, but it's, so it's, it's a process. Good, we have less than 20 minutes left. We still want to achieve a lot in these 20 minutes. But one thing that I wanted to do is to add some tests because I really wanted to connect it to the previous lesson. And for me, that's often a moment when, when I'm actually moving out of a notebook when adding tests. And here one might argue that, well, here we don't need a test because we can see that this is working. But imagine that this is a more complicated, more complex functions, and I would like to really test them. Is this how about you, Samantha? When when are you typically choosing the notebook? When are you leaving the notebook? When are you preferring a script? Is this a good moment to move into a script? Yeah, I think this is definitely a good moment. I would probably personally move earlier already, but mainly because um, if I have stuff in notebooks in different cells, not like we have it now all in one cell, and then I run them separately and in a different order than they are now in this one cell, then it can get pretty messy. Yes. And therefore, I, I would prefer working in a script and then rather run that script than working in a notebook. So let's move to a script. Also, thanks for suggestion 42. Yes, this is a really good moment to, again, get commit our changes because they were good. And it would also be a good moment to then back it up to GitHub. I will not do that just for the sake of time, but it, it, that will be definitely the good move to do. Okay, I don't need this. Let's me save what we did. Only to my disk, but let's also git committed. Now, how do I, how do I move to a script? Are there, you can do them many ways, but one way is file, save and export current notebook as many different things, but I can ex save it as an executable script. And then I can run it in my terminal and I will go from there. So when things grow large, when I want to then split it into more files, that's for me the moment, this is now the moment. So let's save it into an executable script. And now it opened a different window on my, so I'm just saving it into the right place. How should we call it? Temperatures.py save. So now if it's something, I will have the HackMD open. I will now need a little bit more of the terminal space. Adjusting here, so I want to show you the command history, but also the terminal should be visible. And I have tried to make the colors readable. I admit that normally I use a dark background, so I tried to, to tweak it a little bit and make it readable, but it will be a little bit funky. I think the theme of today will be, I don't know, swinging 60s, uh, but hopefully it's readable. So, so what was the first thing to do? It was to commit what we have. This was good. The notebook was good. 
this other notebook that was just for testing. Let's get rid of it. And this is my new script here. And even before looking at it, I will also stage it. And let's make a commit here. Oh, we have split it, split things into functions, 15 minutes left. And now, mm -hmm. oh yeah, before I do anything, I should do oh, one more thing. And that let's connect it to when did we talk about it? On Tuesday. What should I also do? Here's a hint. So yeah, we need to tell the next user of our script what kind of libraries are needed to run that script. And that next user might be us in a few yeah. days because we might have forgotten what are actually needed but also then colleagues or whoever will use it after us, hopefully. Yeah, because this morning I did a, you know, conda install or pip install pandas notlib, so it's working on my computer, but if I give you this notebook, you don't have these libraries. So what is a good way to document this for the next person? That's um, either environment.yaml or I will choose requirements.txt, so that's a Python thing. And in your language, there is a good way to do that. So this is, and, and maybe it's in a readme, but somewhere to document dependencies. I will put them in here, requirements.txt, and I will put in there. So there we, what did we depend on? Matplotlib. We, we depended on, I already forgot, pandas. We could also specify the, the exact version. I would only do that when really publishing the work. While I'm still working, I want to get the latest. I also anticipate that I will need PyTest in this case, because I want to do testing with PyTest. And then what I do, I, do, I document them here. And what I like to do is I actually install dependencies directly from the file. And I have a shortcut for that, but I don't want to confuse anybody. So in my different well, I have a shortcut that I call VE, the virtual environment, and what it does. And could be interesting for all of you to have something like that. It it will go into requirements.txt and install will create a virtual environment for me and install all the dependencies into it. And I do that many times a day. So I have the shortcut. I also have one for Conda. And I always have the dependencies. I document them always for each project separately. And I have an environment for each project separately. So let me run this magic command. But now in this case, what it will do, it will install PyTest because everything else I already have. The important thing is not what I did. The important thing is uh, I, or how I did it. The important thing was I documented my dependencies. And of course, one thing I should do is also this file should be part of my Git repository. Good. Now I'm just running. Let's add some testing into my, and it was temperatures.py. It's also put in these spaces, ugly. And let's make a test for the compute mean. This, so we need to import, do we need to import our test? Maybe. I think so. Just checking my notes. Maybe we will need that. We will need that a little bit later. Import by test. And now I could write a function for the compute mean. Dev test compute mean. 
Pipers will call anything that starts with the test function. Now we need to send in some fantasy data. Let's compute the mean for two, three, four. What do we expect? One plus two plus three plus four, then divided by four, two point five. So we expect that result is 2.5. This is not a super way of testing it because of floating point accuracy. So a better way in this case would be test whether it matches with a numerical precision. This is a way to do it in PyTest, but any other library has a way to figure this out. And Let's save, and now in a different window. Ooh, how do I make it in a not very confusing way? I will go out here now. Now I can run the test. Ooh, and it actually runs the test, but it also does some other stuff, and this is because. We have not commented the plot plt.show. Yeah. So it tries to show this in your. Yeah, what actually happened is that what would have been good here is to put this into a main function. So what I like in Python is to put everything, everything should be in some function, even the main code. And now this is this is a Python thing if name equals something like that. And it's a way for Python to figure out, am I importing it or am I running it? We can think of it as now we have packaged all the main code into also into a function. And here we call it. And if I do that, then it will not it will really now only run the test and not do all the other rest. Now, what, what I always do, but I will not, not do it because of time, is I always verify that the test is working. So I actually introduce a mistake into my code, and then I run the test again. And what I want to see is that the test complains. If the test is then still happy, then, then, then it's not good. So I always do that when adding a new test. But here we trust that everything's good. So let's also stage and commit that git add. Let's stage it. That was a good change. How about this stuff? This stuff should go into code.git ignore. What else can we do? Looking at, oh yeah, add a main function. Thanks, 45. I should have, I should have had this open. Oh uh, yeah, oh, question 44. Sorry that I just used the shortcut. I will share. I will share in the afternoon what I did in detail. But what I did is created a virtual environment, activated it, installed all the dependencies into it. And without typing three lines, I have this one shortcut. Maybe we have time for one more thing. So we have five more, five more minutes before we go into worship summary. And the thing that we wanted to show you is and before doing that, let me commit what we have. Now with tests. Okay, online. Let's remember. Three commits. The thing that we wanted to show you is this one. Let me open the file. We iterate over 2,500, 500. What if I want to have 200? And what if the file name is not called temperatures to CSV? Then I need to modify the file. And it's and that's no problem for me because I know the file. I know where to go. I know I need to go in here and I need to change this to 200 and I know I need to change this file name. But what if this is not your file? 
what if you don't know where to change these things? What if you cannot change them? Because maybe the file is not even open source. You don't know how to modify it. Is there a nice way to modify parameters without modifying the file? And the, the gigantic advantage of that is that when we will do that, there is a nice way, is that then we can, you can run different scenario with the same file without modifying it. You can then, it, it makes it easier to parallelize and use tools like SnakeMake that we've seen on Tuesday. So then what if you want to run a series of, instead of three plots, what if there are 300 plots? And what if I don't want to do them one after the other? I mean, here it took a few milliseconds, but what if, it, what if it takes seconds and minutes? What if I want to run, create all of these 300 plots at the same time on our supercomputer? Then, then there is a better way than what I did. And the, the answer then is to add a command line interface. And we can try that in five minutes, stressful. So there's multiple options that we can use here. We will be demonstrating click, I suggest. Yeah, so there is, in Python, there are many, many options. There's opt pass, out pass, parser, typer, click. It's a personal preference. They all do the same thing. So I personally like. Feel free to take an extra five or 10 minutes if you'd like. The okay, thanks. won't be that long. Thanks. It will not be too long, but this is, I think this is really important. So in Python, that's the one I take, but it could also be, what is the other modern thing in Python? Agbars, block opt. Same idea. What is the idea? The idea is that you add a little bit to your Python code. And what it will then provide for you is a command line interface. It will provide a help text and it will give you give me a way to can you zoom specify, in a little? Oh yeah. It will specify things from the outside. That's what I want to do. I want to do Python temperatures py, but then I want to say number of measurements equals 130. So let's do it. I can never remember how to do that, but I will copy paste here. What is my first first thing I will do? Personally, I actually always add it to requirements because I know that I will I will require the library click. And before even installing it, I document it because then I will not forget. I add it to requirements. Now I use my magic shortcut to install it out of the requirements.txt file. I will show how I do it. So now I have it documented and installed. Now I want to use it. Let's open up my temperatures. And we will see that with very few changes, let's copy this as an inspiration. With very few changes, I can get this to work. So I need to import click. And there is some. Python stuff happening, and I will put that in front of my main function. And what are the fun what are the options that I want to have? I want to have num measurements. Should we have a default? Uh, no. I can even give it a help text. I want to have the input file. The help text here is what would come up if you would type minus minus help, right? Yes, we will, we will verify that input file and output, output file. Oops, let's get rid of this. Output file, we will verify what this read do, does. And the nice thing is now I need to put into my function measurements input set of name output file okay. 
So no. click will pick up actually the names of the arguments from the command yes. line option. So this will be picked up from here. That thing from here. Now I need to also use them. So now measurements I'm using in, instead of temperature CSV, I will use actually input file. Okay, this is not nice, but let's leave it for later. And instead of having the file here, let's use the output file. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we did, I imported a library, I added a couple of lines, and I removed this for loop because I don't need to iterate inside my script anymore. I can now iterate if I want to, I can iterate outside. Let's see whether this is working. I will save it and go outside. And now suspense, Python temperatures, and we have a help function. And these are things we just defined together. So there is some, um, we have a help text. Oh, this shouldn't be text maybe. Hmm. Let's see whether this will work. So what I wanted to do is Python temperatures, number of measurements equals 137 input file is temperatures CSV output file is 137.png. It will complain. Yes, because it I need to tell it that this is a number, not a text. So how do we do that? How did it know that it's an integer? Let's see the default. We can give it a default. I think I can also maybe say type. Let's see whether this works. I'm now just guessing. Let me sneakily ask the internet. Maybe for the sake of time, this is something I could figure out later. So let's give it a default one. Then it will probably, then it will know that this is so. Number, that worked. It's now 137 measurements. Notice how I can now ask for anything without modifying the file. And I could now go and do a lot of these in parallel using supercomputer parallelization or using SnakeMake. So this is really wonderful. There was one question also about the type in the function. So when you moved this uh, mean, calculate mean function to a different script, um, would there be a way to tell Python what kind of, what type of um, data you want there? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So one was also this, so thanks a lot. A nice person on the document, so it works like this. But the, are you asking about type annotations, right? Yes. So that's a really nice thing in Python to do because it will. I have a good example here. Because now instead of having these things, I can say this is a string. Sorry, str. I'm in a different language. This is a number. This is a string, so text. And then you can even say whatever comes out of it is some type. Now I need to find out what is the type of the, the data frame. And this, this can, you can then use tools like MyPy to actually check that the types are really what is going in. It also helps the person reading it because instead of having variable names, it helps me seeing what types does this thing expect. So I use these more and more. But no series, all right. Mm -hmm. I think we are maybe out of time. What, just checking things that I didn't forget to say. Yes, I think I want to say one more thing and that is, 
in the lesson, we have, since this went quickly and we didn't manage everything and that is not even the goal, there is an instructor guide where we these steps are discussed and you can, I recommend you to go through this if you are developing Python. If you are not developing Python, then I recommend to try some of these techniques in your language. And, and I will also then in the afternoon catch up and explain all the little shortcuts that I used or uh, what they really do. So apologies for that. But we, we have used Git, we have used uh, dependency management, notebooks, testing, not too bad. Well, maybe we're out of time. I think there is like one more step you can think about is that as, as a code grows, if it's longer than in, it doesn't fit into the screen anymore, how would you split it into more files? What would you collect into the different files and how can you then reuse it? That's something we didn't manage to show. What else should we say, Samantha? Are we, should we conclude? Hopefully this was fun and useful and. Yeah, I highly suggest to go also in the instructor guide and check out all the different steps that we did again. Also when you're in the situation of having this piece of code that you would like to make more modular. But I think then Richard will continue here and wrap up the work.